today we have the chance to um, host a former astronaut in a prospective one. And the whole idea between um, uh, behind the astronauts is that during training and mission, uh, these people have to uh, stay in, in, in confined spaces uh, with a small group of people uh, for long periods of time. And this makes them basically well-placed people to speak about uh, the topic of isolation, um, uh, hence the purpose of, of this talk. Uh, but uh, just before continuing, I'd like to thank the uh, associations and the uh, organizing committee um, that was involved in making this happen. So the likes of uh, VSCTH, uh, which is the student association, uh, the AVIT, which is the association for the scientific staff, as well as the mental well-being community, and uh, the logo designer, uh, thanks as well, and uh, ETH Zurich for uh, supporting this event. Uh, so the agenda of, of the talk today is as follows. Uh, we'll start with an introduction round. Um, where our panelists, uh, Professor Claude Nicolier, will start us off with the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, he, he was a, a former East astronaut who flew in the 90s. And we'll then uh, listen to Avgustos Padazidis, who is a prospective astronaut from Greece. Um, and then the second part of our discussion will be uh, the main segment, uh, where, where the panelists will answer questions uh, that you've had the chance as an audience to ask uh, during this past week, hopefully. And this will occupy the main, the main uh, the part of the discussion. Uh, eventually, after this segment, uh, we'll go live, we'll use a live Q&A. So for instance, if you didn't have the chance to uh, ask your questions during this past week, uh, now is your time to do so on the live chat of the YouTube live stream. And if, if we, we judge the questions to be interesting for this talk, uh, we're going to ask them. Uh, and on that respect, please, uh, if you have, for example, a question uh, in the likes of how do you go to the toilet in space, perhaps, you know, these are questions that you can Google. So try perhaps to keep the questions focused on uh, the experiences of our panelists here or something that is more um, uh, in the lines of the questions that are going to be asked during the discussion round. Uh, and after this will basically be concluded. Uh, we'll shoot for an hour and a half. Uh, but we have an upper bound at two hours, so um, uh, we'll try to keep it short and sweet, uh, but let's get quality out of this. Uh, so if there's no other comments to make, we can start. Uh, for information, also for the audience, the talk is being recorded, so if you didn't have the time to, uh, to join us, you can do so uh, later time. Watch the recording. It's going to be uploaded on one of the associations for sure. Um, so we can, I guess, start actually with the introduction round. So if you want, uh, Claude, you can start and share your screen and perhaps uh, uh, use a presentation where you can talk about your uh, career path so far and uh, get, get the audience to know you if they don't already do so. <laughs> Uh, sorry, but you're muted, uh, Professor. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to share some of my experience of uh, space flight and uh, isolation. Although um, the one thing I have to say from uh, the start on that I flew on the space shuttle on four occasions and uh, the flights on the space shuttle were in a very small volume. It, we just had the, the flight deck and the mid deck, small volume for seven people, but they were short. And uh, we'll come back to that when we have the general discussion. Uh, you know, yes. the duration of the isolation is one thing, sure. and the volume you have available is another. It is another thing. And the isolation, although um, one thing I have to say from uh, the start on that I flew on the space shuttle on four. Okay, uh, maybe let's start uh, all all the <clears throat> the discussions afterwards. Uh, maybe I start with that presentation. If that's okay with you. Yeah, so you can start with your presentation and your introduction. Uh, we, have the uh, Rashmi, uh, we have a small yeah, meeting issue. Uh, Rashmi, can you disconnect? Can you just mute yourself? There's some background noise here. I'm not so sure. I will. Yeah, can, I, can, I share, can I share the screen yeah. now? Yes, you can. You can. Just the nature of these online events, you know. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, thanks. So, okay, hold on one second. 
We can see your screen. Okay, do you see this coping with insulation, with yes. isolation? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go, <clears throat> excuse me, rather rapidly through this. Uh, okay. And I would like to be sure that uh, it's a proper sizing because sometimes on the first first show of a PowerPoint, it's not properly sized, I have to recycle. Yeah, uh, we don't see the whole screen. Um, so and uh, you see all the, <clears throat> the letters on the left-hand side, all the way to the bottom? Uh, no, there's, they're actually a bit cut off. I don't know if you can- Okay, just... let, let me recycle then, hold on a second. Yes. Okay, no problem. How about now? Uh, uh, this is better, yeah. Okay, yeah, exactly. we have, that's a problem I've, I've, I've noted uh, a few times. All right, um, so again, I'll go rather rapidly through this presentation. It's just to give you an introduction into the job as an astronaut. Again, shuttle astronaut, you see me uh, here on a spacewalk I did on the 23rd of December, 1999. That was my last flight about 20 years ago. Uh, doing some repair work on the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a nice picture because you see I'm, I have my spacesuit, the uh, EMU, Extravehicular, Extravehicular Mobility Unit, the uh, US spacesuit. And uh, do you see the arrow? Um, my arrow, okay. Anyway, yeah. I have uh, here on the top part of uh, the visor of my helmet, you see the Earth. So I was uh, head down to the Earth with my feet in the payload bay just about to take out a computer, a new computer for the Hubble Space Telescope from a, a container in the payload bay with the intention to install it on Hubble, which I did with my colleague, Mike Fold in the following half hour or so. Okay. Uh, do you see the picture, right? And uh, do you see when I point to something, do you see the yes. pointer? Yes, all good, yes. You see it, okay. All right, just brief, very briefly about uh, my education. And uh, I, I show here some, some ingredients of uh, uh, becoming an astronaut, passion. You must have passion, obviously. Uh, if you think that going in space is boring, then you should select another job, passion. I had the privilege of quality education here in Switzerland um, at the level of uh, uh, family, academics, military, a lot of supports, uh, opportunities that became available and were taken not without risk from a job point of view. I was very lucky to be able to do that, no doubt. I was uh, selected in the first uh, group of uh, European Space Agency astronauts in 1978, and uh, there were about 6,000 applicants. And of course, you, you work hard in order to be successful, but uh, the, the luck is a factor, and uh, you can pull the luck towards you, and I certainly did that, but uh, you, must, you must be lucky, and I was and being crazy sometimes also. Um, again, it was an unbelievable privilege uh, to uh, work in such an environment. Of course, when you go up on a space mission, especially on shuttle missions that were very short and very condensed, you go primarily to do a certain job, but you do it in an environment that is absolutely superb. And uh, this picture is an indication of that. In addition, you have weightlessness, absence of gravity, which is of course very pleasant. Um, I had a passion for the sky, uh, did a lot of astrophotography. The, this, this is a picture I took in La Palma, Canary Island, uh, the sky. I always had passion for the sky and I became an astrophysicist. That was my first job after studies in physics in Lausanne and astrophysics in uh, Geneva. Uh, I, liked, I liked cartoons and uh, there is a space cartoon that is very well known in the French speaking world. It's On a Marché sur la Lune. It was uh, written and drawn in uh, 1954, and I was 10 years of age at that time. That was before the first uh, satellite was put uh, on orbit around the Earth. Sputnik 1 was in 1957, but I, was, I always was inspired as a kid about uh, such uh, cartoons. I became, uh, in uh, parallel with my activity as a, an astronomer, I became an Air Force pilot, which uh, in Switzerland was uh, no longer now, but was at that time a part-time activity. So you were a dentist or a teacher or a politician, and then uh, <clears throat> part-time, about six weeks per year, you were training uh, in your squadron. So this is the beginning of the training in the south part of Switzerland, Magadino. Then uh, during 22 years, I was um, incorporated in a squadron of uh, Hawker Hunter, that's a fighter bomber from England that we used as a fighter bomber. 
for the ones who come from outside of Switzerland, Switzerland is a very peaceful country, but we have a, we have a defense system. I never was to war, fortunately, but uh, we trained to do ground attack and interception and things like that. For me, it was a very good part of my education because it's finally coping with uh, machines that can kill you if you don't do the right thing. And that was the right amount of operational training. During this time, that was in the 60s, of course, the Apollo program took place. And for me, this was a fascinating adventure, but it was, of course, Americans doing this. And of course, uh, Soviets were going to space also. And it became uh, available for Europeans only at the end of the 70s by invitation uh, by the US uh, for participation by Europeans and by Canadians also. Of course, Apollo 11 was a huge source of inspiration in July 1969. And uh, then came the shuttle program that was uh, the following program after the end of the Apollo program in the US uh, for space exploration, but with the goal to use the capabilities of a low earth orbit only, not going back to the moon. Quite an impressive vehicle with a so-called orbiter uh, cabin for seven people on top, uh, pretty large cargo bay, about 15 meters long, four and a half meters wide. Uh, three hydrogen engine in the bottom of the orbiter, but the thrust was not sufficient to take it up uh, vertically. So we had two solid rocket boosters on both sides of the huge external tank containing about 700 tons of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen also for these three engines. Uh, going up to space was taking uh, about uh, eight and a half minutes from uh, engine starts until reaching orbital conditions. And here we are on orbit. Uh, nice picture of the shuttle taken from a satellite that had been deployed from the payload bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was um, a mission in 1984, one of the early missions. Then the shuttle separated from the satellite, the same attitude. And uh, in a way, the astronaut took a selfie of themselves. They commanded uh, a Hass Hasselblad camera that was in the satellite to take a picture of themselves, quite, quite a nice picture. You have to imagine that the velocity vector of the shuttle is inside the screen. Um, <clears throat> so it's like an airplane flying with 90 degrees angle of attack, but obviously in space, it doesn't matter because basically there's no air. There's still, still some particles, uh, some electrons and ions, but a very low density. Uh, that's a nice picture. This was uh, taken on another shuttle mission in 1985 with Bruce McCandless. We did a spacewalk and used the so-called man maneuvering unit to move away from the shuttle without being tethered. There was no cable attachment between him and the shuttle because he had the maneuvering capability in translation and in rotation. Quite an impressive picture. Uh, the shuttle was quite a complex machine. This is the flight deck. Uh, for the ascent, you had the commander sitting on the left-hand side, the pilot on the right side. Then you have two other crew members in the back in the flight deck. Then there was another compartment called the mid deck below the flight deck for three other crew members for seven total. But you see it's very complex, a lot of switches. This is typically a cockpit of, a, of an aerospace vehicle designed in the 70s. The first flight of the shuttle was in 1981. It flew for 30 years. Uh, until 2011, but the cockpit was a cockpit of basically designed in the 70s, although there was an improvement with the glass front cockpit that was installed in the year 2000. But anyway, quite a complex machine. And that that was uh, basically the, uh, the workspace in addition to the mid deck uh, below the flight deck uh, for missions of typically 10 to 12 days. This is the aft cockpit. So this was uh, looking forward toward the, the nose of the orbiter. But if you turn 180 degrees, you have the aft cockpit. And that was uh, the part of the cockpit that was used mainly during the on-orbit phase. Typically, if you had to do a rendezvous and proximity operation with Hubble, for instance, the commander was flying the shuttle in rotation with the rotational hand controller here, translation with the translation hand controller, which we don't see very well here. Then the robot arm operator was using also a rotation hand controller for the arm and translation hand controller for the arm also near the pilot who was doing the fly toward the target. But as you see, a lot of switches, quite a complex environment. 
These are the four missions that I had the privilege to execute between uh, the summer of 92 for the first one until December 99. And the two in the bottom were missions uh, to the Hubble Space Telescope, including the very first servicing mission of Hubble in uh, December 93. So one, two, three, four, you see the duration, relatively short time, maximum 15 days for my mission number three. That was a crew for my first flight, uh, Lauren Shriver, the commander, and we deployed uh, Eureka, uh, European Retrievable Carrier Scientific Platform using the robot arm, and then we try to test the so-called tethered satellite, satellite at the end of a cable to try to generate electricity to the conducting cable with a copper core. And uh, the cop this uh, cable cutting the magnetic field lines uh, nearly perpendicular was producing a voltage between the upper body and the lower body we wanted to test that. Didn't have too much success because we had a jam of the deployer up after about 200 meters, although we had 20 kilometers of tether uh, in the payload base. So it was uh, only a partial success, not total success. Some pictures taken during this mission, my commander eating M&Ms or Smarties that move slowly from his open hand to his mouth. Quite a nice picture. Um, that's the uh, <clears throat> cockpit of the space shuttle, the old cockpit, this is the early version with electromechanical instruments. Uh, but two of my fellow crew members, are, I, I cannot recognize them, but anyway, two out of my Six other crew members are looking at the earth through the front window uh, of the cockpit of the shuttle. You see they have their feet up because there's, there's no gravity. Basically you can have your feet on the side wall or up. Uh, each of the switches here on the ceiling is protected by metal loops as you can see. So you don't change the position of switches inadvertently with your feet. Um, the work and uh, rest time uh, cycle is divided in slices of 24 hours. So pretty much like on earth, uh, because we know it works pretty well on earth. You sleep for about six, seven hours. Uh, you wake up, you have about an hour and a half of preparation. Then you work for about 12, 13 hours. At the end of the day, you have another hour and a half free time. Then you go sleep. And uh, when we went to sleep, each of us had a sleeping bag and we installed it wherever we wanted on the sidewall, on the ceiling. It's not recommended to sleep floating because you don't sleep very well. You need to have your head against some kind of a pillow or cushion. And the head has to be pushed by a piece of uh, fabric uh, with Velcro because the head doesn't tend to rest uh, against the, <clears throat> the pillow, obviously because of, of the absence of gravity. Anyway, that's Hubble that uh, was launched in uh, 1990 and serviced uh, on five occasions. I was on a two out of the five servicing missions of Hubble. I won't go into the detail of the telescope. It's quite a complex machine, but of course there were a lot of uh, ambitions uh, with the uh, Hubble that was going to be a very high resolution um, <clears throat> imaging system for celestial objects. We expected of the order 1 20th of an arc second resolution, as opposed to about a half a uh, arc second resolution for ground-based telescopes. That's a primary mirror, 2.4 meter in diameter. Unfortunately, it was not uh, shaped exactly uh, correctly. So we had a so-called spheric elaboration. The, that's, I show it here for a lens, but for a mirror, it's the same thing. The outer rays had a focus at, in a certain location and the inner rays of the, for the mirror here is a lens, but again, same thing, had a focus in another location. So there's no place here where you put the CCD array, well, you'll have a sharp picture. That was the problem with a, a Hubble primary mirror. And that was not detected until the telescope was in space. Here you see the deployment of Hubble, 600 kilometers altitude, 28 degree inclination of the orbit, uh, release of the telescope with a robot arm. Now it's free flying in space. And um, again, we had that problem with the spheric elaboration and uh, pictures that were not sharp. Uh, anyway, it was foreseen to have so-called servicing missions of Hubble. And total, we had five of them, the last 20, 2009. And the first one was three and a half years after the deployment of Hubble to orbit. And of course, the main goal of that first one was to install an optical corrector to correct for the faulty shape of the primary mirror. We exchanged the solar arrays also. 
that the crew that was selected, uh, basically six Americans and myself, uh, five American males and uh, one woman, uh, Katie Thornton, very talented. And uh, that was about a year before the mission. Uh, one of the first thing we do when a crew is selected, uh, we have uh, the official crew picture Then we start uh, training for about a year to accomplish this mission for about 11 days. We, that first servicing mission was 11 day duration. We did a lot of work in the virtual reality lab, but that was in the early 90s, not virtual reality as we have it now. The commander, Dick Cavi, Ken Bowersox, Katie Thornton and myself. That's one of the space potential space walking crew member being in a virtual reality. And I'm taking him to the telescope with a robot arm. So we trained or evaluated uh, the way to do the re repair of the telescope in the virtual reality lab. Then we did it in the water to simulate weightlessness that the replacement his replacement of one of the cameras, the wide field camera in the water for training. And that's the reality during the mission. Uh, we trained, as I mentioned, for about a year. Then uh, the night of the 1st to the 2nd of December, 93, we were brought uh, with a little bus to, uh, to our spaceship. It is quite a, quite a special moment, I can tell you. In the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, uh, you arrive there at the launch uh, pad and you take an elevator up to this level, you go on this bridge all the way to the cockpit where you uh, <coughs> get installed on your seat with the feet up. Of course, we, we are not sitting like uh, you're all sitting now looking at uh, this presentation, but we have the feet up. And then there's a countdown and we had a lift off at uh, 4.26 in the morning. Destination Hubble. Uh, which we made a rendezvous with and uh, we were close to it uh, two days after liftoff for 48 hours and I was responsible for the capture of the telescope with the robot arm and also in support of all of the spacewalks that we did. And then uh, after capture, the next five days, we did five spacewalks, each lasting about um, seven hours uh, to do the repair work. That's the installation of the optical corrector by two of my fellow crew members. I'm commanding the robot arm. That's the last uh, of the spacewalks. We exchanged the solar rays with the telescope. That's one of my fellow crew members, another one in the payload bay, always two people when you do spacewalks. A beautiful view you can see here. We are over Australia, 600 kilometers, and you see Antarctic in the background, black sky, beautiful. Uh, from a visual point of view, it's an absolutely magnificent view. It's even hard to work when you have such an incredible view. Oops, uh, that was the crew at the end uh, of all of our repair work with a new solar rays. We we're going to deploy the telescope after this picture was taken. And uh, only a few weeks later, we saw the, that the optical correction was uh, good. This is a picture of Messier 100. It's uh, a galaxy in the Messier catalog before the correction and after the correction. So the optical correction worked fine. You see here, HSC is for Hubble Space Telescope. WFPC one is wide field and planetary camera number one. And that uh, the camera that uh, was replaced uh, later and you see the pictures is perfect after that. Mm -hmm. I was uh, privileged to be <clears throat> part of a, the third servicing mission also this time as one of the space walking crew member training in the water with a, a high fidelity model of uh, Hubble. Uh, the challenge of space walking that's taken from a cartoon, this cartoon that I was looking when I was a kid that uh, inspired me very much for space flight. <laughs> that's the kind of thing you want to avoid to do when you are space walking, just being detached from the structure and uh, only relying on your safety tether here. Yeah. Uh, that's a preparation for spacewalk number two for this mission, the third servicing mission of Hubble, December 99. We are preparing for the second spacewalk. That was my spacesuit here. This is my colleague spacewalk, uh, spacesuit. And we have here all the equipment we, we will take for that uh, specific spacewalk. You need to be very rigorous to take out what you need for the specific spacewalk because you go through the airlock and once the airlock has been depressurized to go back to the pressurized compartment takes a long time. Uh, exit from the airlock. And then here we are replacing the main computer of Hubble. I'm here with my colleague, Mindful, Mike Fold. You see the safety tether here. You always have a safety tether because if you are not tethered, you may be lost in space. And if your tools that you are using 
are not tethered, you may very well use them also. Tethering is a very, uh, very important, uh, strict uh, operation you always need to do when you're outside. A little later, I'm here at the end of the robot arm, which changed the fine guidance sensor, pointing camera. That's the old one that was defective. And I'm installing the new one in the telescope. Again, over Australia, 600 kilometers. Nice view of the telescope just before release after the end of the repair. It's attached to the robot arm. A thin crescent of the earth about one minute before sunset. Uh, everything worked fine on that second, uh, for me, second uh, servicing mission of Hubble. In the program of Hubble servicing, it was the third one. Uh, we replaced mainly the gyroscopes, uh, three or even four out of six had failed and the main computer needed also a, a boost. That's, uh, that was the reason for this uh, third servicing mission. Uh, very rapidly, this is all the kind of a celestial object that the telescope is uh, studying, the galaxies, cluster of galaxies, uh, clouds of gas in our galaxy out of which uh, stars are formed, planetary nebulae, planets and uh, comet. I don't want to do a full course in astronomy here, but just to tell you that it's a very versatile instrument to observe all kinds of objects in the sky. This is a cloud of uh, uh, mainly hydrogen gas in our galaxy out of which stars are formed. This is a very active region of star formation. This is the visible part of the spectrum that's in the infrared. A lot of pictures of galaxies and clusters of galaxies and uh, so-called deep fields. Sometimes the telescope is still functioning well now, about uh, 11 years after the last servicing mission. Sometimes it's pointed to a region of the sky, a small window where there's nothing or hardly anything. And after hours or days of exposure, you have pictures that reveal an incredible amount of uh, galaxies, very far away galaxies. So we have learned a lot about the uh, formation of galaxies because we see these galaxies as they were, the faintest one, as they were billions of years in the past. So we learn about the evolution of galaxies and evolution of the universe as a whole. All right, ISS, we can talk about ISS later. Of course, this is a different kind of space mission. The astronauts stay normally six months on board ISS. So in terms of uh, isolation, it's another environment. Uh, it's quite a complex spacecraft. It is assembled in about uh, 11 years from uh, 2000 to 2011, and that's the US OS segment with a US lab and uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, here the US OS with the US lab here, a node, the Columbus uh, European module and the Japanese module, and that's the Russian segment in the back. So this is seen from the front of the station, the station of velocity vector would be out of the screen towards you. And the big solar rays at the end of a big truss here. These are radiators, which you see here. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, shuttle over Zurich. I don't know exactly where you are, but you are somewhere here, I guess. That was uh, in July 2005, taken from the International Space Station just before docking of the shuttle with the ISS. Quite a, quite a nice picture. At about 400 kilometers altitude above uh, Zurich and the Zurichsee and the Zugersee. Lucerne is here with the Pilatus. Mm. Just a few words about the lesson learned from human space exploration. These are my own thoughts, not so much something official from uh, NASA or ESA. Clear goal, discipline, work together at all levels, lead to success. I go rapidly through these. We can talk about these later. Yes. Very thorough preparation and training, attention to detail, no stone unturned. Uh, do not less, let yourself turn down by adversity. Fix the problem and move forward. We have very often adversity, you just need to attack the problem and to reestablish normality and reach the goals. Learn from the past and apply these lessons. Determination and motivation, and that's a lesson from the Apollo program. If you really want it, you can do it. It seemed impossible to do this in uh, less than 10 years from the, the words of Kennedy in 1961 until uh, 1969, Apollo 11, but it became possible because there was so much uh, will to be successful. Okay, that's all I wanted to show in about a half hour. I took a little time, but I think it's good introduction. Yes. I will stop the sharing now, except if you have questions and I need to show again one of the pictures. Uh, I think we're going to have a live Q&A session if time permits at the end. So people are going to be able to ask their questions using the live chat and we can come back to this uh, later for sure. Okay.
Yeah, so thanks for uh, this speech. It's, uh, it's uh, mesmerizing the source of knowledge we have here. Uh, but, but okay, we're a bit over time, but that's okay. So maybe we can uh, uh, ask Augustus to go ahead and uh, do his own presentation uh, so that our uh, audience can uh, get to know him as well. And then we can head to the question and answer session. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, so if you can just do a full screen. Yeah, I think it's okay now. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today. Also, I feel uh, honored and humbled to be in the same panel with uh, former astronauts and Professor Claude Nicolier, uh, who is a role model uh, for me. So let me introduce myself. My name is Augustus Padazidis. I'm a career astronaut candidate for a private organization in the United States and an analog astronaut. Um, some things about me. Uh, I'm a career astronaut candidate uh, for advanced exploration since uh, 2019. Also, I have uh, taken part in several analog missions as an analog astronaut and uh, specialized in the mapping and sampling of the Moon and Martian surface and in the construction of hydroponic uh, systems for space applications. Uh, also, I am a project manager of the analog mission program of the Green Space Society, which is a chapter of the American National Space Society in Greece. At the last but not least, I'm a pilot in training and uh, a, a, a scuba diver. Uh, as for, for my studies, I hold a diploma in Master of Engineering in Mineral Research Engineering in Technical University of Crete in Greece. Uh, I had I specialized through my thesis in the planetary geology and uh, more specifically in uh, the identification of uh, Martian analogs on Earth, especially in Santorini Volcano of Greece. Uh, so I continue my postgraduate studies in the Agriculture University of Athens and uh, in spec specifically in the Geological and Mineralogical Laboratory of the University. And I had the opportunity to, to deepen further my knowledge for recognition, the classification of meteorites and for the planetary geology. Also, I had the opportunity to make my first steps in space agriculture. Finally, in the academic year of uh, 2018 and 2019, I, I was responsible for the space agriculture development and research team uh, based on the Agriculture and Construction Laboratory of the Agricultural University of Athens. And uh, also I would like to mention that uh, my career as an athlete and I was a national champion and member of the national team of Monte Pendathlon. I think that uh, uh, my path as an athlete helped me to develop skills and uh, um, like, like multidisciplinary and de devotion and discipline, which is important to meet the high demands of uh, training and uh, space uh, training space mission simulations. So now some things about my the space simulation missions that I have taken part so far. Uh, first of all, uh, last year I was elected as the first Greek career astronaut candidate in the advanced exploration restaurant competition. Uh, this uh, um, organization company that is based in California, United States. Uh, this program is the lar largest and most comprehensive private astronaut program, selection program in the world. And it is designed to prepare candidates for participation in suborbital space missions, uh, orbital missions and mission to the moon and Mars. Uh, so I have uh, already taken part in two analog missions as an analog astronaut. The first one was, was in the last February. Uh, I took part in the uh, mission is called AMIS-4. As an analog astronaut, ISRU and Greenhouse, Greenhouse Specialist. Uh, this mission was conducted under the auspices of the European Space Agency uh, through the International Lunar Exploration Working Group and the International Moon Base Alliance uh, and took, took place in, in the high seas uh, analog facility in Hawaii in the United States. The second one was the mission called Endymion, which took place in the Lunaris Mission Station in Poland. In this mission, I was vice commander uh, and also was uh, responsible for the extravehicular activities 
for the mapping and the sampling of the lunar uh, surface. And also I was, I was in charge for, for the biolab where we conducted experiments uh, of uh, plants uh, cultivation through the use of uh, Mars simulation, uh, Mars, Martian regolith simulants as mineral, mineralogical substrates for the plants, plants growing. Um, also, I will be the commander of the first uh, Greek uh, mission in the same station. It was uh, scheduled to take place this, this May, but because of the COVID-19 situation, it has been postponed. Maybe in the summer, July, no good have the opportunity to to, to, to the mission. Uh, last but not least, I last year I had the opportunity to visit Switzerland uh, many times uh, because of the Igluna project, uh, Habitat in Ice. Uh, I in this in this project it was the Ciclamina team. Ciclamina team. Ciclamina is the ac the acronym of the cybernetic plants to some cybernetic companion plants to mitigate insufficient interaction with nature. And this experiment concerns the development of an artificial interface between the astronaut and the plant in order to counteract the syndrome of inadequate interaction with nature during the long-term missions. So this is uh, my introduction. And this is a, a list of partners that are currently supporting I um, mean, my effort. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, promising uh, stuff coming up, and surely we wish you the very best in this uh, endeavor of yours. Um, so perhaps now we, it's time to uh, start uh, the main part of this discussion, which is the answers to the questions that uh, the audience had prepared. Um, we'll try to go uh, in alternative fashion, uh, and of course, if there are more space-related questions, uh, they might be more targeted to Claude, but uh, I will try to uh, keep the balance going uh, so that we can hopefully try to answer all the questions, but of course, uh, complete answers are uh, favored. Uh, so you can take your, your time to answer, uh, and, uh, and uh, yes, we can start uh, on this path. So the questions that we've had are basically split into off mission and mission questions. Uh, so it all starts with preparation. And Claude, maybe you can start us start us off with the first question on um, how are you prepared on Earth, uh, mentally and physically, to face isolation on a real mission? And have you been quarantined as part of your training? And did you have any coaches or psychologists there specifically for that topic? Okay, well, it's a good question. Uh, I will first answer the, the part of the question, do you have coaches or psychologists there specifically for that topic? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so as uh, I mentioned, I trained nearly entirely in the United States for my shuttle missions. And uh, typically the so-called mission specific training was taking about a year to a year and a half. And we always had uh, psychologists ready to help the crew in case there was any, because the, the workload is quite high, because each of these missions is a really high responsibility and uh, we, we, we have a stress during training, no doubt about that, but I have to say that during the preparation for my four missions on the shuttle, we never, never asked the psychologist to come and help us <laughs> because, and um, one of the reasons is, is, is the following. We, we are very highly motivated people. I, I mentioned passion as being one of the uh, basic ingredients. And uh, once uh, a set of uh, seven people were assigned to a given shuttle mission with a pretty high goal and hard to reach, which was at least for me, specifically as an astronomer, extremely motivating, motivating to go and fix Hubble. Uh, there is an automatic, uh, very positive spirit within the crew to do everything we can do to be successful. And uh, the, <clears throat> the distribution of the task was, uh, was made within a relatively short time after the crew was assigned. So between the commander and the pilot and the so-called mission specialist, we decided who was going to be doing what. We, we were sharing the, the responsibility and uh, uh, we had such a high motivation to be successful on the mission that uh, everything was going quite smooth. Sometimes there were discussions 
but very rarely the voice elevated. And as soon as the voice is elevated, then we come down and uh, we discuss quietly and we come uh, to a consensus on uh, the way to do things. And uh, from a psychological point of view, it was always very, very serene and uh, quiet and uh, goal oriented so that uh, really a, a psychologist was ready to help us in case it was needed. But uh, at least in my case, on my four preparation for the four shuttle mission, we never needed uh, psychologists. Now the preparation mentally and physically to face isolation on a real mission. I mentioned that the shuttle missions were short, typically 10 to 15 days maximum. So, uh, you know, the isolation is not, not an issue. You are in a small volume, seven people as mentioned, but you have on an extremely high motivation to be successful. So there's never any boring time, obviously. And I mentioned also, and I showed some pictures indicating the beauty of, of, the, of the scene. And also the absence of gravity is a very positive thing. You can use the whole volume and not only the surface of the floor. So there was uh, strictly no reason to have any preparation for the, for the isolation and for the, I would say, confinement, uh, because we were, uh, seven of us, uh, the density of people or the number of bodies per cubic meter was relatively high, but there were large windows giving us a splendid view over the earth and the sky and the sunrises, the sunset. You have seven, 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets per terrestrial day. So if you like those and you look out the window at the right time, uh, it's really beautiful. So there was zero problem with uh, with isolation. And also not so much with separation from uh, people on the ground because we had nearly constantly contact with the ground. Uh, we had sometimes contact with our families, although that on the shuttle time, it was only once per week. But you know, to be away from the family uh, for a week and then you have opportunity to talk to uh, your spouse and your children for about 15 minutes uh, on these relatively short uh, special time for communication with the family. And then uh, you go back to work for another uh, four or five days and then you come back. It's not a big deal in terms of being separated from your loved ones and, uh, and your close friends. Now about the quarantine, we were quarantined before the mission for about 10 days. And the idea was to avoid that we could get any uh, any bugs uh, and get the flu or a cold in the, a few days before the mission. And everyone that we interacted with, with physically, uh, the instructors and so, uh, had to go through a medical check to be sure they didn't have anything. The family also, we could see uh, not the small children, uh, that is not possible, but uh, all family members beyond age 16, we could visit them if they had gone through the, the medical check. So that was the only quarantine we were uh, subject to. Of course, no quarantine after the mission because we didn't go to another celestial body. We stayed in yes. a rather uh, hygienic uh, environment of the space shuttle. So mm -hmm. that's about uh, for question one. Yes, yes. Okay, so maybe Augustus, uh, thanks for your answer first, uh, Claude. Maybe Augustus, in your experience, do you have something to add to this or...? Yeah, of course. Uh, basically, for me, that I'm currently in the process of preparation training, there is no specific training schedule that I have to follow before a simulation mission. But uh, I try to prepare myself and spend more time alone thinking about uh, the mission and trying to slowly adapt to the new daily routine to which I will have to adjust in the coming days. Um, so about uh, and the other question about the psychologist, uh, before uh, the simulation missions, we had to pass some tests, questionnaires and interview with psychologists. But in my, during my daily life, I have a coach who tries to teach me uh, emotional management techniques, including meditation, which plays an important role to this. OK. Okay, thanks. Uh, sure. Okay, so it's really dependent on the, the timing of the mission. Uh, so if, if we actually think about uh, maybe Augustus, you can start us off with this one. Um, there is a difference between what we're going through now where we don't know um, when the lockdown measures are going to completely relax and knowing that a mission has a certain duration. Uh, so uh, what difference does it make for you, Augustus, to, to know the duration of the isolation you've been through? Um, for your mission simulations versus the current uh, uncertainty? 
Yes, interesting question. So, in my opinion, uh, if you know in advance the length of the mission's duration and uh, the length of your stay in a confined environment, if it is from a few weeks, like my missions, or to 500 days, which was, which was uh, the duration of uh, Mars 500 uh, simulation experiment, um, you have the opportunity to prepare yourself in psychological terms. Uh, in contrast to the current situation with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, in which we don't know exactly uh, how long uh, the restrictive measures will last, uh, but also what uh, um, we don't know what the subsequent social and economic consequences will be around the world. Uh, I think that the pressure and the stress during the isolation is much greater for people because of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, so do, do you see it? How do you see it on your side, Claude? Is it the same or? Yes, of course, we have to realize that um, the isolation we have now is, is, is very relative isolation, at least in Switzerland, you know, we have a partial confinement. Uh, I personally uh, go out for about two hours a day to walk or to run. Uh, I live in the countryside in a small village, so uh, I, I, I can do that. So it's really uh, only partial uh, isolation. I think knowing how long it will last is an important factor, but we never were in complete isolation. And that's a special case for Switzerland. I know that our neighbors, at least in France, are much more confined than, than we are. So on one hand, it was not uh, uh, a total confinement. And finally, it was relatively short. And we are slowly coming out of the uh, confinement situation here in Switzerland. Uh, things are opening up. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, of course, it depends very much in, the, in, in, in the, the quality of the environment where you are living. I, I have the privilege of living in a smaller house in a, in a village outside of Lausanne. The weather has been rather good in general. And for me, I never felt that the confinement was very painful. But what I was somewhat suffering from was um, uh, contact with my family, with my two daughters and their families. But uh, we use FaceTime every day on a few occasions. And they bring me some food also sometimes because uh, I'm in a... Uh, age group uh, such that I'm a person so-called at risk. I'm in good health, fortunately, but uh, I'm beyond 65 years of age. But I never felt I was in total confinement. But I think knowing that uh, it has a certain duration, typically on our shuttle mission, we knew that it was never going to be more than 20 days because after 20 days in space, you die because you don't, don't have any more oxygen <laughs> in the space shuttle. <laughs> so and that was a very clear indication that it was going to be uh, coming to an end. At any rate, it was relatively short. And uh, again, the confinement that we have here with the COVID-19, at least here in Switzerland, is only a, a, a partial confinement. And it's slowly, we are slowly coming out of it right now. So not a big problem. Yes. Okay. So it, it does indeed uh, depend on whether astronauts has been have been for long in space. Uh, I think typically in the ISS they usually stay for uh, maybe longer. Uh, yeah, they say six months, and some of them have stayed for one year, yes. and that that's quite long. Uh, I've been talking to Scott Kelly, who stayed for a year, and he wrote a book. Uh, the title is Endurance, and you need endurance. There's no doubt about that. And I think that uh, there are two factors. There is the length of the mission, and there is a motivation. Uh, if we have people, we can talk about this later maybe, but if you go to Mars and it takes uh, seven or eight months to go there, it's a very long time in a small volume and the outside when you look out, you don't see any stars because it's always illuminated by the sun, so you don't see the stars. So it's a black environment outside. Yeah. It's a long time, but the goal of the mission is extraordinary. To go on the end of the mission, at least uh, uh, of the one-way mission to Mars, is to land on another celestial body, being on your own, because nobody will help you uh, over there. So it, it's adventure at its highest level and is so motivating. And I think the high elevation of the level of, of uh, adventure is such that even though it's a pretty long journey, you'll stay motivated. That's my feeling. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Okay, so, so um, we also had this question about uh, family coming from the audience. Um, you mentioned it previously that you can speak to them every now and then, but there's also, you know, this, do, does your family itself go actually through uh, any preparation, either uh, during preparation, uh, while you're on duty or when you're back? Because I, I presume that 
you know, when, when you're off to a mission, I think the organizing body has to let your family know that there's also a chance you might not come back. That's and true. Yeah. If not, maybe there would be some kind of uh, preparation uh, for your family itself, from the family. Uh, that, that's a good question. In fact, uh, I would say that, again, my experience is shuttle flight. Uh, for shuttle flight uh, and flight preparation for shuttle mission, the most difficult part was really uh, the final part of the training in the last few uh, weeks, maybe eight weeks of uh, preparation because it's very intense. And uh, the crew members uh, have their head full of the mission. Uh, you spend a lot of time in the simulator and talking about uh, uh, <clears throat> potential problem on the mission and how to solve them. You get a lot of training for coping with malfunctions and failures and you have your head very full. So you are less mentally available for the family. For my family, it was quite hard the, the last two months. The mission itself, um, the, the ascent to space is dangerous, there's no doubt. And there was, uh, my, my wife was very scared uh, uh, of the ascent to space. Once you are on orbit, you feel very safe. And the family knew that. And we had this possibility of communicating uh, uh, with them every now and then. So that is fine. And then after you return, it's, um, it's a big relief and uh, it's a happy time. And uh, so there are these three phases. For my family, the most difficult was pre-mission, the last two months before the mission. During the mission itself, each of the crew member had a so-called family escort who was a fellow astronaut who was taking care of the family during the whole mission, trying to solve all the uh, all the, the little practical problem, go and pick up the kids in the school. Uh, the family escort would do this uh, to help the, <laughs> the spouse. And uh, if there is any uh, interesting or special part of the mission, typically a spacewalk, uh, the family escort will take uh, the family to the mission control center viewing room, would explain to them what's happening. So uh, during the mission, the family escort concept was a very, very, very worthwhile concept. So to summarize, pre-mission, hard for the family just before going. Uh, then the ascent is, uh, my wife was totally scared, uh, I must say. It was a very difficult time for her. The mission time is okay. Uh, and the family escort was a good concept to help the family. And post-mission is, is, is wonderful. That was the summary. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, incredible. I mean, uh, the pressure if you're, if you're the spouse of an astronaut must be... Uh, Something else, I guess. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's uh, advance then. Uh, Augustus, maybe uh, there might be a small overlap here, but we, we also had the question if, if you feel the difference uh, between the current isolation versus the one on mission for, for you mean for you at least on the mission simulation. Uh, you said, for example, that in Poland you were for two weeks inside the, the same uh, base. I guess you didn't really go outside; you just focused on experiments and so on. And uh, I think the audience was thinking, do you have maybe some similarities uh, that you feel again now? Yeah, um, my opinion, even though the analog missions in which I have participated uh, lasted less than the current isolation period, you said that it was two weeks, weeks, both of them in high season till lunar gestation was two weeks. Um, the truth is that, uh, that in an analog mission, Analog astronauts cannot go out to the supermarket to exercise or to go to the chemists or to walk, or to walk with uh, their dogs are they currently doing in this quarantine. So we, they are confined in a small place with other five people uh, who, are not members, uh, who are not members of their family and they might not know each other very well or not at all. And that means that uh, astronauts need to have developed, I think, real isolation skills and need to have worked with themselves to deal with, it, with that. And the major factor that uh, helps astronauts to stay positive in the environment is the higher purpose of the mission. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that uh, COVID-19 also gives a higher purpose, much like uh, being in space does because we are saving lives uh, through this quarantine process. So it's important to understand that uh, the bigger purpose is the more reasons to give you to continue to put up uh, with, uh, with this situation. Uh, on the other hand, common people are not trained to handle isolation like astronauts. They didn't have a choice, just an invisible enemy stuck them 
at home and change their daily routine. So the result was that a billion of people had to work remotely and uh, many people lost uh, their job during the quarantine. So I think that uh, this uncertainty for the future because of this kind of isolation uh, brings more pressure and depression uh, during the stay in a confined environment. Mm -hmm. Even if for me, because everything has been cancelled, so I, I, feel, uh, I feel something like different in this kind of isolation than in, in, in mission because uh, of the uncertainty, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's, there's a difference of uncertainty. Okay, so Claude, maybe if you have your own uh, input, but uh, to this question, we also had uh, the thing you mentioned about uh, being quarantined before you go on a mission because you don't want to bring uh, germs from Earth into a space or because uh, they want to make sure you're not sick when you go out there. And it seems like this quarantine just before the mission is more like the one we're going today uh, today because you're actually, I mean, more in a confined space and you actually can't go outside this time. Uh, so did you get a feeling of, of, of uh, similarity between this this particular time and now? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, we This was done at uh, crew quarters at the Johnson Space Center, which was the base for astronauts and uh, our training uh, training location. And um, <clears throat> uh, it was a, a very uh, special time because we did not do any more very intense training because we didn't want to be tired uh, going up to space until the beginning of the quarantine, about 10 days before the mission, we trained very, very, at a very high intensity. The idea was to get our head and our bodies also uh, ready for the mission, but we had to slow down for the, the last two weeks. And uh, we were at these crew quarters, which were very comfortable. Uh, we had the gym that was uh, very close. So we could go out also. We could not go, to, of course, to, 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 to the, outside the Johnson Space Center, but of course we went to the simulator, we went to the gym, we could walk around and not interact with people physically. No. Um, so there was some resemblance with the quarantine we have here, but of course it was very short, only 10 days. And uh, again, uh, there is always the idea, and uh, Augusto mentioned that, the purpose. Uh, when you have quarantine or you have an isolation period of any kind, and there is a clear purpose, it's much easier to take. And uh, <clears throat> the isolation we have now because of the COVID-19, there is a purpose. And uh, Augusto mentioned that uh, <laughs> in order to avoid being infected or infect infecting other people. And on the other hand, you can have other purposes. I found a lot of other purposes like uh, teaching my course at EPFL uh, using Zoom is something that I discovered can be very well done and has even some advantage versus a, a course that you give in a classroom. I mm. found the students much more interactive. They ask more questions. Oh, yeah. maybe, because, because, maybe because they are not visible where they ask the question, I don't know. But uh, mm. so uh, the purpose is, is a very important uh, thing. And of course, the quarantine we had before the mission was on one hand short and the purpose was clear uh, to get a to, to avoid getting contaminated by any bug that you could imagine and to have a little bit of a slowdown in training before going to space because you want to be mentally and physically fit. By the way, we had the gym nearby. It was interesting because uh, <coughs> we were adapting our rhythm of uh, rest and work to the day of launch. And typically for the first servicing mission of Hubble, we lifted off at 4.26 in the morning. We had to wake up at 10 p.m. the night before for the preparation, went to the launch pad at two o'clock in the morning on the 2nd of December, 93. So during the week before, during this quarantine period, we were going to bed at 2 p.m. and waking up at 10 p.m. <laughs> so, so that you don't have the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the shift of, uh, uh, or jet lag the day of launch, but you had, we had it at the beginning of that week. So at, uh, at the end of that week with a special timing, we were fully ready in terms of our body clock uh, for the for the the day of uh, of liftoff, and it's funny because the idea was if it is day for you, you have to be in so-called bright light. When it was, um, yeah. uh, let's say, I said we go to bed at two p.m. and then uh, we wake up at ten. If you go at midnight, two hours after waking up to the gym, the gym had to be in bright light, wow. as if it was day for us. 
And this was helping us being synchronized with this new rhythm that we're going to have the day of launch. And the, the bright light concept was very useful. It had to be completely dark during the night portion from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. But after 10 p.m., wherever we were going, it had to be in a bright light environment. <laughs> it worked good. It's a very artificial, useful system. Artificial yeah. bright light. Okay. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, so now we perhaps uh, wanted to see, um, you know, the effectiveness of training. So we had this question about uh, both in a safety and isolation uh, point of view. Uh, Claude, what was for you the main difference um, the, when you went up there uh, versus when you prepared on Earth uh, as far as safety and isolation? D did you feel like uh, on spa in space you had enough confidence to execute what you were trained up for? Um, that yeah, that, that's, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, of course, NASA has a lot of experience about training astronauts. You know, I trained uh, between, uh, well, 1990 and, and uh, uh, excuse me, 1980 and uh, 92, 12 years, uh, because uh, my mission was delayed because of the challenge accident and all that. So I had a lot of training time. And uh, NASA has a lot of experience about training astronauts. And the idea is to train astronaut extensively for the nominal mission and for any kind of a failure or problem that we can think about could happen during the mission. Um, <clears throat> the training was excellent and the quality and intensity of the training is such that uh, you don't feel stress or there's very little stress because you are confident you can solve nearly any problem. Mm -hmm. I remember during the mission itself, most yeah. of the, yes? Even on your first time? Yeah, even the first time, yeah. Well, because I had, I was in an environment where my fellow crew members had flown before and they were telling me a lot of things. Wow. And I have to say that uh, during the on-orbit phase, the, the ascent to space, which is relatively short, eight and a half minutes, is always a little bit stressful, there's no doubt, because that's the most dangerous phase. But on orbit, we felt we are ready for nearly anything. Yeah. And uh, even for the spacewalk, the training for spacewalk was so good that I remember coming out of the, the airlock on my spacewalk on the 23rd of December, 99, to replace the main computer of Hubble and one of the fine guidance sensors. After a few minutes, I was looking out and I could see exactly what I had seen in the water many times with it very high fidelity uh, models in the water. And I felt completely at ease. Only there were no more divers and no more bubbles and the, the view was uh, more spectacular than in the, the neutral buoyancy facility in Houston. But basically it was the same and I was totally confident. I felt I can do it. I was still feeling, Claude, don't do, make any mistake, but the environment is known and you know what to do and it's going to work. And I, I was totally confident. So good training makes you confident, reduces the stress and makes it much more likely that you will be successful. For sure. Okay. 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 Nice. Thanks. Um, so, so let's go back to this question of Gustos of uh, physical meetings and, and direct direct interactions. Uh, for instance, in Poland, uh, if you had two weeks to be inside inside the space, um, you know th this direct interaction cannot be replaced by by uh, texting texting your dearest ones. And how did you cope with this during mission uh, in your experience in Poland? Uh, you had two weeks inside the space, but did you have the chance to speak or how did it work for you? This is a question that usually people ask me. Um, so during uh, a simulation mission, the contact with our loved ones was limited. Uh, and this was a moon mission. On Mars, it's uh, much more harder. Uh, so video calls or phone calls were not allowed it at all. Okay. So the only contact we had, we had was uh, via email and uh, during center hours of the day, uh, 8 to 10 in the morning and 8 to 10 uh, in the evening. On Mars simulation mission, it's much harder because there is a 40 minutes delay in the communication. So you have to, if you send an email, you have to wait 40 minutes for, 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 for the response. So uh, for me, it was quite easy to adapt uh, to this program because I could uh, read my emails in the morning as soon as I wake up and uh, after the breakfast. And while I knew that uh, after the, the end of the schedule, I would see the new message again. Even uh, this routine helped me a lot to 
help me help me psychologically uh, during the mission. But um, indeed, uh, uh, the the physical interaction cannot be replaced by texting your dearest ones, even if uh, we, uh, with not with not um, maybe a, a call or a video call. Physical interaction can be replaced. Mm. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's something uh, we have to take, I guess. It's, it's part of the job, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you had something to add, Claude. Maybe you, you did talk about uh, your calls you can make on the space shuttle. Uh, I guess it was scheduled. and. <clears throat> yeah, it was scheduled, but also there's a question of, a, of trust. The fact that we had this family escort, for me, I, was, I had total trust that my family was well taken care of. And of course, the family had uh, could follow the news and uh, could ask the family escort to listen to the air to ground. And uh, uh, again, this concept of the family escort was was a huge help for the astronaut to be confident that the family was well taken care of. And of course, the family could uh, follow pretty closely what was going up without talking to us, except during this short period that I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they could uh, track the air to ground, all the communication. They could hear me sometime talking, and uh, they knew how the mission was going. And again, the on-orbit phase was considered a very safe uh, phase of the mission. Very, you know, we are just doing our job. It's a very interesting job. There's passion. We are in a magnificent environment. Uh, and my family was aware of the fact that I was happy there and I was doing something useful. And I had confidence that my family was taken care of by the family escort. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, okay, this, this this part of family is is is, is interesting. Um, uh, we were wondering also, um, more generally, Claude, if if during a mission, uh, do you take time uh, for yourself? Basically, do, do you have time each day or week to just focus on yourself, just separate yourself from the job, the mission, and and whatever uh, you're supposed to do up there, just to focus on yourself and your well-being, or do you really just push through and then and focus on the mission the whole time without taking some time off for yourself. Yeah, I have to say there was very little time uh, where you are really on your own and you don't really need it. At least I personally did not. Again, I had an extreme level of motivation for uh, for the goals of the mission. Fix Hubble, you know, this <laughs> incredible discovery machine that doesn't work. You go there and you go fix it. And after that, it works. And it's something that you do as a, as a team. And I did not feel I needed again. You talk about 10, 11 days, it's not very long, but I did not have the need for much personal time, except when I was going to the restroom. Yeah. <laughs> but, but really from a, a psychological uh, uh, a time for yourself, uh, for your thoughts, not really needed. There was some, of course, when you go to bed and you sleep, you're on your own, you can have your, your own thought. Here you don't interact with other people. But uh, apart from this uh, period of time just before sleeping, where I had some thoughts, obviously, uh, I did not need much more than that. Okay, okay. And how about you, Augustus? Did you uh, have some time? Did they allow for some time for yourself? Perhaps there's less stress in this situation. I don't know. I think that uh, many people will be able to answer this question after this, uh, this uh, COVID-19 isolation, uh, because there are people that live, uh, the whole, fa whole families in a few square meters, so they, uh, they can understand how important it is to find some private uh, space. So for me, uh, when you are in a very small place with other people, the private space and time has a different meaning. I mean, the, you begin to ap ap appreciate the slightest, the slightest amount of time that you are alone and enjoying the peace. Uh, personally, in both missions that I have participated, I try to make the most out of this time, trying to spend as much as time I could in private. Uh, as for if you, um, you definitely, you definitely, you definitely. Um, push through and focus on the big, bigger picture and the purpose of the mission. And uh, because there are a lot of activities involved and uh, there is a continuing interaction with, uh, with your team members that uh, helps you to, to, to have a stable, um, to stable mental health. Okay, yes, sure. Mm -hmm. um, this is one another uh, issue to, to solve. Um, 
But the next question is really about uh, length as well, but perhaps uh, the short missions are less um, qualified for, for, for an answer. But the question was after how much time, uh, Claude, maybe you can start us off. Uh, do you start feeling the effects of isolation if, if you felt them during a mission? Uh, perhaps, of course, this is more uh, relatable to ISS astronauts. Uh, but, you know, we had, there's some dynamics, you know, when we started this uh, lockdown, people were somehow, I don't know, interested in uh, how, how we're going to have a new, new type of life. You know, we're kind of, everyone's part of history now uh, being into COVID, uh, having been through this isolation. And everyone has, uh, has had their own time to um, feel maybe the effects of isolation, depending on your environment, if it was a, a month or a few weeks or, or more than that. Um, do you, how much time did it take for you now? And do you, do you feel there's a comparison to be made uh, with respect to your mission? Uh, yeah, as far as the mission is concerned, um, after how much time do you start feeling the effect of isolation? In fact, uh, I, I never did feel it. Again, there were short mission, uh, extreme, extreme motivation and uh, workload. And uh, I didn't feel uh, isolation. Uh, it, it was not a factor, I would say. And the fact, again, the fact of, of being able to communicate once with my family during these, uh, uh, this mission, it was after six or seven days uh, once, and that, uh, that was a precious time, but uh, there was not a problem with this feeling of isolation being uncomfortable. I, I, I feel it's more now vis-a-vis uh, -vis my family, because again, we can communicate with FaceTime and uh, <clears throat> we say hi. <coughs> But uh, you know, it's been nearly two months now, and uh, I would like I would like to see my my daughters again and their families. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something painful. In fact, we have plans because now we are authorized to go and see the grandchildren, and uh, I'll go and see my grandchildren on Sunday. Uh, again, it's something that is formally authorized, and I will use that opportunity and I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So for me, this current situation is a little more pa painful as far as uh, having contact with the family because it's been two months now uh, than on my mission that were typically less than two weeks. Yes, two, okay. And, and for you, Augusto, do you have anything to add to this uh, part? As far mm -hmm. as the dynamics of... Uh, yeah. of no, so Therese, in, in the first days of the mission, there is this excitement that uh, overwhelms the feeling of... Uh, of isolation. Uh, personally, I started feeling isolated or on the third or fourth day when I realized that I was uh, now cut off uh, the outside world. So comparing with the current situation, uh, the transition to isolation uh, has taken place in a different way. Uh, while citizens have not been prepared to all adapt to isolation like trained astronauts, as I mentioned before. Yeah, that's so, it's also definitely different for each person and it also depends on the activities or work that the person had to do while at home. Yeah. So I believe that if you have many responsibilities at home, then I suppose that uh, time uh, go by uh, more easily. Mm, yes, I'd agree with this. I'm, I'm on my own and so I can, and I, I felt them quite uh, fast, I'd say. Um, Okay, anyway, we can move on to the next. Uh, Claude, you, you talked about the relaxation of coming back. Uh, and this is with respect to looking to the future, uh, because we have some lockdown measures. And in Switzerland, especially, there we seem, it seems like we're going to be one of the first to be relaxed uh, to a comfortable level, I'd say. Um, so if we had maybe some advice to give, how could we ease society uh, um, into coming back together when the lockdown measures relax? But how did it also feel for you to be reintegrated into society, especially your first time uh, when coming back from a mission? Yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> it, for shuttle flights, it was not so much the mission itself, but it was the uh, extreme high workload during the last uh, couple of months prior to the flight. And these two months prior flight with extreme workload. Uh, we were a little bit isolated from the rest of the society just because we had to have our head full of, uh, of the mission. <laughs> and the mission itself had a, was a short duration compared to this uh, high workload of uh, the last two months uh, of preparation for the mission. So in a way, when uh, at the end of the mission, when we interact normally with other people uh, uh, again, 
um, you have to consider that you have been a little bit outside of a normal uh, social uh, activity, not uh, for the 10 days of the mission, but for the last uh, two and a half months, I would say. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. The last two months of the, of the training are so intense, you, you don't interact with too many people except your family, but your family suffers a little bit because you have the, the mission in your head. And you interact with the uh, instructors and the... Uh, Uh, so um, <laughs> that's is actually before the mission and not during uh, the yeah not before the mission and of course um, uh, as as far as what will happen now when we slowly return to normal what is uh, interesting and we'll see what happened but it's going to be a slow return yeah. uh, i normally travel a lot i teach during the spring semester and i have a lot of uh, journeys in the fall mainly in south america where I'm a, i'm a guide and i had a few trips planned including total solar eclipse on the 14th of december and uh, now they tell us that probably we will not be able to go out of the country except maybe in some countries in europe but uh, the united states and south america maybe in 2021 so this slow return to normal as far as ability to to travel it's something that i will suffer from because uh, i like to travel a lot Yes. And uh, I would not be able to so interact with, um, you know, people around me and uh, the family and then students uh, locally and maybe go to the mountain a little bit with some friends, keeping some distance. But, you know, it's going to be a very slow return and the long journey is only next year. And I must say I, I, I suffer from that because that's contrary to what I like to do and yeah. I'm used to do. I do. So I, I was thinking in that, in that respect, I know from, um, from my own family circle that if you want to travel, a good place to go is Antarctica now. Um, <laughs> well, but you know, you probably cannot do this for quite a while because you need to go to South America, to Argentina, to Ushuaia, and it's probably not going to be possible until late this year or maybe next year. Uh, okay, that's, uh, that's something to think about for uh, the ones who want to go there. <laughs> Uh, okay, thanks. And, and you, have, do you have uh, something to add, maybe, to this uh, relaxation uh, issue? Do you, do you have some? Do you have something in mind about how you're going to get back into society? Um, however, the governments decide to ease us back into it. Yeah, um, my first mission in, uh, during my first mission in uh, Lunaris, Lunaris Research Station in Poland, we were totally confined. Even uh, the EVA activities uh, would took place under a huge uh, tent. So according to my experience so far, I would say that the moment uh, that the mission adds the feeling, uh, for example, when you smell a flower for the first time in a long time and uh, you know the wind hits you on the face uh, is unique. Uh, as for the interaction with other people, uh, after the mission, I would say that uh, After the first simulation mission in, in Poland, I will not hide from you that um, while we developed a strong bond uh, with the, the rest members of the crew, the joy of seeing my loved one again was uh, the gray, was, was great. So uh, to, uh, to easy transition into society when the lockdown measures relax, This will, I think that this uh, surely take time to get uh, used to the new reality in psychological terms. I mean that the, tra the transition will not be one off, uh, but uh, will come step by step. Uh, for people um, uh, like in Greece right now, one week ago, we could not go anywhere without to text, to send a message yeah. and to say the purpose of our EVA. Uh, but now we have to to be we have we have uh, more um, we we have to can go outside but uh, we have to be careful and to wear a mask so this is uh, um, we try to come back to the normal life step by step. Yes. Okay. So there. Yeah. It's certainly more uh, relaxed than what you guys have been through. I mean, we can always call people and speak outside when we go out. Um, Uh, but there's perhaps perhaps a component of seeing the people you used to see that um, is there now, and it's going to change when when the measures go down. Uh, okay, so so maybe a more uh, astronaut related question. Um, as far as training goes, I don't know if either of you can 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 start on this. Uh, maybe Claude, 
Uh, do you see there's a, a difference in astronaut training then and, and now, as far as isolation at least goes, or maybe something else? Because it seems these days that astronaut training is um, more focused also on isolation in my mind, because they're always talking about these missions of uh, colonizing the moon and colonizing Mars. And, and if you go there, it's certainly not going to be for 15 days. Uh, so uh, we were wondering, is there a difference? Do they add more of this isolation component uh, in your eyes into their training? Because uh, um, uh, the, the, this colony idea is, you know, for staying one, two, I don't know how many years there, uh, because of course missions are expensive and so on and so forth. So do you see a difference? Yeah, of course, uh, I have the shuttle experience and uh, astronaut training was training about the technical aspect and the engineering aspect and the science and the operational aspect. And uh, isolation was not even talked about because again, uh, we, are, we knew we we're going to be in a small environment uh, during uh, typically 10, 11, 12 days, except that we could go out sometimes for the spacewalks by definition. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like now during the confinement when we go out uh, in many cases we need to have a mask when you go spacewalking we had a mask also even more than just a mask <laughs> um <clears throat> of course uh, the the training so this isolation aspect and training were totally uh, separated you know we trained for shuttle flight from a technical uh, operational and scientific point of view, isolation was not even a factor. Yes, um, yes. For people who, are, who go to the International Space Station, I don't know exactly if they have any training about this isolation aspect you have on the station for typically six months. I cannot really sp speak about that. For the winds, the ones who will go to, to Mars, that's going to be much more difficult because again, uh, it's, it's going to be a long journey far from Earth and far from Mars. You know, after a few days, the Earth will be a very small celestial body, uh, like uh, after three days, going to be like uh, the Apollo astronauts were seeing the Earth. Uh, yeah. And it still is beautiful and, and interesting. But after one week and two weeks, it's going to be a small, well, uh, relatively bright object, a blue, blue object in the sky. And Mars will be a very small red dot. And it's going to take months and months until you are close to Mars and it's going to be... Uh, from a visual point of view, interesting to look at Mars and the landing spot. So from a visual point of view, a visual aspect is a very important factor. On ISS, you have the Earth, you have the cupola, and the cupola is a place where astronauts love to go when they don't work because they see the Earth and it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so the isolation is made much uh, easier in the station because you have these large window to uh, the Earth and also to the uh, to the sky during when you are in the eclipse, when you're on the, the night portion of the Earth, where you see the stars and the, uh, and the moon and the, the planets, and it's beautiful. Uh, the tough part about isolation for a long time will be going to Mars. There's no doubt about that. For mm. us, for shuttle, it was not a factor. Mm. For ISS, it's not too big a factor for six months. For Mars, it's going to be really hard. Yeah, so I think there's uh, actually a lot of learning experience for society also for going through this uh, isolation. And that's what I've heard uh, left and right about these challenges of staying on your own for so many weeks for money or just being to, to sleep as much as possible for whatever reason. And uh, yeah, it seems to be interesting that there's a, a, a gradient in an evolution in the way astronauts are trained now uh, because missions uh, seem to evolve into being more long-term uh, than before. Um, okay, yes. Uh, so, Avgusos, if you have anything to add, or perhaps not, because it seems that you're going to be the one who's going to be subject to, to this isolation training, um, but as you wish. Um. Again, isolation with a clear and fascinating goal is much easier to take than isolation in boredom. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Maybe the main takeaway. Uh, okay, so so maybe we can have this last question focused, maybe because we're you know in a student organization, uh, part of the university. This is part of uh, ETH and all these associations. We had this last question on, uh, given all of your experiences, uh, what advice can you give to students studying at home during this uh, interesting period? Maybe you have Gustos. Uh, okay, do you have your your piece of advice for us? 
We have, we have exams in uh, a month here and in, in Zurich we also have the privilege uh, to have exams in the middle of August. So uh, what do you think of this? Yeah, uh, I'm a student too. So I think that uh, for us to remain our psychological balance at high levels because of this uncertainty of uh, of the exams, for example, in Greece, uh, we don't know the, the students that do not know yet when uh, when the exams will take place. I think that we have uh, to understand the purpose again of the situation and actually the risk that us, our family, and our friends friends are facing right now. Um, we have to identify what is uh, the objective of the mission and what we have to accomplish during the mission. So when uh, we can also thinking a positive and productive way, for example, to keep track of productive things that we accomplish each day, and it's a unique chance to, to do something different that uh, we haven't maybe tried before, like uh, to start a new project or to learn something uh, that we always want to learn, for example, for me, uh, COVID-19 isolation was an incredible chance to revise uh, my Russian, Russian language skills. Yeah, so that's, that's my, my, my advice. Uh, and you, Claude, maybe as a professor, do you, do you have something for your students to, to add to this? Uh, you are muted, Claude, I think we don't Sorry. Miss. Yeah, I think in general, uh, what is important is to have a plan uh, for your days. I, the yeah. best thing is to think the day before, the night before, what am I, am I going to do next next day and uh, have a plan. You don't want to work all the time, of course, but have some period uh, where you, you, you work. Uh, if you have motivation for the subject of the exam, then uh, you want to be successful and you want to devote some time uh, when you will uh, study and uh, try to... Uh, to, to, to get to a level of knowledge such that you are pretty sure you are going to have a good grade at the exam. Uh, communicate with people, you know, again, uh, talking about FaceTime, communicate with your friends, with your family members. I think it's uh, useful. And I think sometimes do things that are, that are fun, you know, uh, do some experiments in cooking. I've been doing this myself here. Uh, and uh, I've been using quite a lot of time looking at the sky in the evening. We had beautiful days. We had, uh, you know, we have Venus in the uh, uh, evening sky. We had Venus crossing the Pleiades. That was at the beginning of April or the 3rd of April. I took some pictures of that. Uh, we had a beautiful view of the, the, the moon with a thin crescent close to Venus. In the morning, we have Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn together uh, just about 45 minutes before sunrise. So uh, have this little project to do things that you normally don't do, although I personally observe the sky nearly all the time, but they were very, very striking and beautiful phenomena in the evening and in the morning and trying to take pictures, which is not easy. Um, <clears throat> that, these are the recommendations, but have a plan I think is important. Yeah, as a, uh, I'm a professor and I have my student who will take uh, the examination at the beginning of August uh, from the 3rd to the, um, to the 10th of August. And uh, I, I organize some sessions where we review the content of the course so that they can uh, uh, increase their knowledge on the subject of the course and be more likely to, to be successful on the exam. Uh, I think I try to keep interaction with the students. I plan to do this until uh, late July so as to bring them to a good level of preparation to be successful at the exam. But in general, I think this idea, have a plan, communicate and do things that are fun in cooking and looking at the sky, these are my recommendations. Okay, this is the name of the game uh, <laughs> for you. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot. This We've been through um, actually all of the questions, but uh, the live Q&A has generated quite a few of them. Uh, so I'll just uh, check uh, quickly here what we have. Um, so uh, using the live chat, we have our moderator asking questions. Do you use the chat function or should, should, can we, can uh, we get there? Or? Uh, I'm going to basically, the moderator has already picked the questions for us and I'm going through them to basically scan and then I'll just okay. ask them. So but do, do, can we have the question uh, listed on, the, on a page? So that, that's even better than handling them only verbally. Um, can you share with us the sheet with the questions? 
Uh, yes, I can share my screen now. Let's go with number one. Uh, let me just check the here. I think. Ah, here we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and here we go. Okay, I see, uh, I see that, yeah. The first one, I'm not sure. Well, the, these questions were generated now, so we'll see what happens. Uh, it says, who or what do you think of uh, during isolation beside details related to your job space mission? Is there something like musing, music reading or sports that helps you most throughout the training and missions? Maybe, Augustus, can you start us off with this one? Yes, of course. Um, during the mission, I used to, to work out at least uh, two hours per day. So that's uh, helped me to, to, to manage my mental, mental health my and, my, and my psychological statement during the mission. And uh, also, day per day, they, we had uh, movie nights with the rest of the crew. That's uh, oh, okay. part of the fun part of the mission that we had the chance to interact with each other and to watch something called together. This is a, the basic uh, uh, things that uh, I did during my daily routine in, in the mission besides the work and the experiments and the EV activities that we had to perform. Okay, sure, okay. And for you, Claude, maybe apart from the mission, you know, you're up there, you're, you're focused on the mission, but is there anything else uh, that occupies you? <laughs> Days uh, yeah, and in fact, uh, during the preparation, sports is an important factor. And uh, even now, during the confinement, I personally go out at least an hour and a half uh, per day outside and walk and run in the forest and in the fields uh, close to my village. Uh, so physical activity is really important, not only from the physical point of view, but mental point of view as well. As far as music is concerned, there's some, some music that I like a lot. And uh, we could take, it was limited, but we could take... Uh, five CDs at that time it was CDs yeah. uh, and uh, I was taking my favorite music and I was listening to music just before sleeping uh, during the uh, typical day you know the 12 13 hours of a work day with uh, eight going eight times around the earth uh, no no music during because we're fully immersed in operation to do what was expected from us uh, fixing Hubble uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> And during a spacewalk, you don't listen to music. You just uh, uh, support the spacewalk. You do it when you're outside or you support it from inside, but no, 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 not much time for music or, or, or reading. But mm -hmm. uh, when you're more relaxed uh, before sleeping, I was always listening to some music. Yes, okay. Yeah, so there's also this physical component of, of having actually to train. Uh, otherwise, your uh, muscles would not be able to keep up uh, because you don't have to hold your body, I think, anymore uh, when you're up there. Um, uh, okay, so let's head on to question two, which is more effective for resilience. Uh, okay, this is a question, I guess, of discipline. If, um, you know, perhaps extending beyond the mission, uh, when you chase this career of being an astronaut, um, maybe also very relevant for Augustus, uh, which is more effective, is effective for resilience, i.e., which is more um, going to let you keep, keep keep yourself on track? Is it the motivation throughout the years of trying to stay on course? Or do you, do you have the assigned, well-designed uh, uh, routines? Um, and how has how how's the uh, uh, amount of passion and motivation grown in you? So I guess <laughs> the question of being chasing for, for everyone, and in particular for astronauts, uh, maybe, Claude, you can start us off with, with your experience about how um, um, your habits, maybe, and your motivation throughout the years have evolved to, to become what you've become. And maybe Augustus can tell us also on his side, you know, coming from Greece, uh, the conditions are perhaps not well designed for, for um, producing astronauts. It is not a, a country uh, that is used to doing this. Uh, so, so both can, uh, perhaps he can learn and I can learn also just for my own endeavors. Um, motivation versus uh, discipline, I guess. What is your take on this? Yeah, in fact, motivation and passion, these are things that you have in you or you don't have them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you don't need to really uh, cultivate that. It's there. It, it's something that uh, if you have passion, you want to do something. I, I want to, to be part of uh, exploration in, uh, in astrophysics and uh, in space. And... Um, <clears throat> 
it's not something that you need to work on. It, it, it comes out of you. And uh, why, I have no idea. You know, I had early passion for the sky, for astrophysics and for airplanes. And I cannot explain why. Uh, some of it may come from, in a way, genes. And some of it comes from the environment. I had a, a very uh, <clears throat> positive environment in my family. My father was always uh, telling me, do what you like to do, and, uh, but do it well whatever the, the subject is, you know, whether it's studying butterflies or uh, whether it's becoming a, a, a physicist or a medical doctor, or whatever you want to do, but do it well. Excellence was a thing that the, my, my parents and my father in particular was always um, uh, uh, pushing forward. Uh, I had passion and for me to help me being always happy in what I was doing. I, w I wonder why I was paid for all of what I did in my, in my life until now, whether it was as an aviator or whether it was as, a, as an astrophysicist or as an astronaut, I always had passion and huge pleasure doing it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, this is more of a, also life, uh, I guess, uh, advice for, for everyone, myself, the audience, and uh, yes. So, Augustus, maybe do you have uh, so, some some of your own story, especially coming from yeah. Greece and going through the adversity of of trying to become an astronaut in a in a minor country, at least in the field. Of course, as I mentioned during my presentation, when I was a teenager, I was an athlete. So that means that uh, I had to wake up 5.30 in the morning to go for swimming. And after the school, I had to do other five hours of training. That needs discipline and devotion to the purpose to become better and better and to be comp competitive. Uh, this is the same feeling that I feel uh, when I'm thinking about a possible astronaut career. I'm not an astronaut. I hope to become an astronaut in the future. Uh, because here in Greece, there's not a lot of chances. You said that a small country with no human space flight program. And uh, until now, there's no any Greek astronaut uh, for European Space Agency. So to become an astronaut in Greece, there are two options. The first one is via European Space Agency and the second one with the new one. And uh, I'm trying to take my chance there is uh, with, a private, uh, with private companies. It's so uh, I tried to, 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 to I, I'm trying to prove myself that I'm going to be a better version of myself every day. That I'm going to achieve uh, the, all my goals step by step. Uh, for a Greek, it's very difficult to become an astronaut, and uh, this is my goal. And I don't know if I will ever, uh, if I will ever be go to ever be in space. I hope so. I'm trying for it, but until now, I'm very. Uh, happy and uh, for for myself and I'm trying every day to, to become better and better and to to improve my skills uh, that's uh, why now I'm I, I, I'm pilot in training and I'm a scuba diver also I, I'm trying to learn Russian I'm trying to improve uh, all my skills so to take my chance to go in space one day so this is the I think that the, uh, the most important factor is to to stay devoted and to become better and better and not to be stable during your life because of you find uh, you, you, you have found a good job with a good salary. Uh, I think, yes, you have to, to think that uh, each year you have to, to achieve your goals and to become a better version of yourself. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, insights. Uh, one more question we had was about uh, actually miss, mi missing something about the, the missions you did. Um, what was the version uh, you felt coming back from the space shuttle after your final space shuttle mission? Did you know it was the final one? Or, or, or how, what did you actually miss, miss from these missions? And, and, and what did you think of, uh, what, specifically they say, what's the first thing you did after coming back? So how do you look at the future? once you know your, your final mission has been uh, finished, Claude? Well, uh, when we were coming back from a mission, we were coming back from a very sterile environment. You know, the, the inside of the space shuttle was pretty much like a hospital. Uh, <laughs> and the International Space Station uh, is, is maybe a little more messy because you have a lot of storage everywhere. You have seen pictures, but uh, 
shell was very sterile and I was looking forward to go and run in the forest and listen to the birds and uh, have the smell of the forest. That's one thing. Then I wanted to drink a beer uh, and uh, I wanted to have uh, fajitas, you know, go to a Mexican restaurant in Houston and uh, have normal food, not the food that had been dehydrated that you rehydrate. Uh, so these little things were things that I was, uh, I was missing, but of course it was not a, it was not a huge problem because the missions were relatively short. Um, uh, but you know things of life like this uh, the smell of forest uh, drinking a beer with friends and uh, having special foods uh, away from this uh, dehydrated food we had which was quite good but still there was some special food that I that I was missing and I was yeah. happy to see them again and, to and get them again yeah and, and in the mission itself did you coming back in earth did you miss something uh, from the mission itself Yeah, of course. Uh, the worst day of the mission, uh, again, there were short mission, typically 12 days. The worst was the last day when we had to come back. Uh, of course, you want to stay longer than two weeks. Uh, for the one who stayed for six months, uh, they say six months is quite long. And the one who stayed for one year, they say that one year is really long. And that's why Scott Kelly wrote this book, Endurance. Yeah. Uh, one year in space is hard. Uh, six months is quite long. Two weeks is too short. That's the way I would summarize it. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. And uh, you have Gustos. Maybe do, do you miss something from the simulations you've done? Yeah. Uh, I will agree with Claude that uh, after the simulation, the, the thing that missed me most was uh, the food. It's difficult to eat uh, for freeze-dried food for two weeks during my first mission. I and then. Correlation with the exercise, I lost four kilos in two weeks and uh, two and a half kilos of mask mass. So it was something ex exhausted for me. So when I, the mission ended, uh, I was in, in Poland. The first uh, thing that I ate was a Greek salad. And this was the, the, the test, it's the, the best Greek salad I have ever ate uh, in my life because it was, it was the first real food, fresh food that I ate uh, after two weeks of freeze-dried food. So yeah, for me, the food, it's, uh, it's the thing that uh, missed me more, most during uh, the isolation mission. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, a personality question, uh, maybe? Uh, Claude, maybe you can uh, tell us, after, after returning from your missions, uh, what were the biggest changes you noticed in, in yourself as um, perhaps as a person or, or something changed uh, in you when you came back from these <clears throat> missions? Was it the case? Yeah, uh, a space mission is, is, a, is a huge and wonderful personal experience. And uh, for me, uh, the, the most striking thing was uh, the awareness that you gain over uh, the earth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the humanity on this uh, Uh, <clears throat> big spaceship that planet Earth is with uh, 7.8 billion uh, crew members and uh, you are looking at this from outside and uh, looking at the Earth uh, like a celestial body of course you can only do it when you are outside of it and you are you don't you don't have the experience when you are in an airplane because you are still too close to Earth but being really outside of this envelope of, of a gas, the atmosphere that surrounds the earth uh, makes you aware of a lot of things. And uh, you realize how fragile our habitat is uh, and uh, how confined we are. In fact, humanity that is stuck on the surface of the earth, having to take care of it. So, so it doesn't develop into something uh, ugly over the next few decades and centuries. Uh, because of our own fault. So awareness is something that, that is really the, the main thing that you learn after coming back from space. Right? Awareness about uh, the fragility and uh, the very uh, uh, special condition that we have, humanity on the surface of this small and fragile celestial body. I also came back with the uh, very positive thing about the value of a uh, Um, teamwork in order to accomplish big goals in space. So fixing Hubble, especially the first time when we had this big, uh, big problem. Before going there, I was wondering, are we going to be able to make it? And I was not the only one among uh, uh, the, the crew members of this first mission uh, to doubt that we could really make it. But with the, 
on one hand, the huge motivation, the quality of the training, the support we had from the ground to accomplish this, we were able to make it. So uh, <clears throat> I came with the, the realization of a thing that you can do if you have motivation, you work as a team and uh, uh, you are properly trained. And that was a, something that I learned that was a, a wonderful and very positive thing. So awareness on one hand, and a realization that you can do big things if you work as a team and have the motivation to do it. Okay, yes, it is a recurring thought that uh, seeing the planet and all these stars, you know, they just put a perspective on, on, on humanity and the small trivialities that we shouldn't be worrying uh, when you see the whole thing as a whole. Um, uh, do you have maybe a comment to add to this, uh, Augustus? Um, perhaps from your simulations, uh, how did you feel yeah. but, uh, before, after of, of Gustos uh, going through these simulations? Yeah, the only thing that I can say about the simulations is that uh, after the simulation missions, I returned more passionate and devoted to continue the hard work. But um, the overview effect that uh, Professor Nicolier uh, described before and the feeling of uh, when you realize that uh, the earth, the earth is just a blue spot on, on space and the, the way that your, your perspective stays in, during a space flight is for me one of the major reasons that I want to become an astronaut and uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to go to space. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, this changes everything you you believe or you you think about the nature and how to behave the nature and it, uh, you you return with more respect and uh, this is this this feeling i want to feel in the future in space during a space mission mm -hmm. okay uh, so it seems like our moderator has uh, already told us the last questions we have here uh, <clears throat> it's focused to you claude and it's also with relation to uh augustinos for uh astronaut careers, uh, what would be your message for next generation astronauts like Augustinos? Well, have passion and motivation. That's a big thing. And uh, I think Augustino has it and all the ones who want to do this job, they, they have to have this uh, spark and uh, passion and motivation. Uh, the second point would be take good care of yourself and of, uh, of your colleagues and, uh, and friends and uh, family take care of yourself and the people around you. And uh, the, the third point would be uh, train, 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 use every opportunity to learn new things that are related to the accomplishment of the mission and try to reach levels of excellence. It's not always possible. I, do, I by far not pretend that I, I could read this level of excellence, but always try to reach excellence. Uh, so the, the motivation, take care of yourself and of your fellow crew members, train, learn new things, and try to reach levels of excellence. These are the three messages that I would give. Okay, thank you very much. And, and it seems we just had a la very last question coming here. Uh, I think it's also for you, Claude. I don't know if, if Gutinos can add to it, but it's more for the audience, I guess. How can we uh, best get in touch with space-related programs, events, industries in Switzerland? I would say, you know, as a student, there's many student organizations, uh, rocket teams and so on that have been on my own and then events you can attend like Future of Space and all these, but what is your take on, on, on somebody who wants to get close to airspace in Switzerland, uh, Claude? Well, I personally follow a lot of the space news and uh, you have uh, the website of NASA, the European Space Agency, which are very well done. And of course, uh, uh, nearly all of the activities, space activities in Switzerland are activities that are related to ESA, you know, because we don't have a, our own space agency. We are one of the member states of uh, ESA, a relatively small member state, but very respected, very productive. And I follow very closely what ESA does and NASA does. And uh, uh, of course, what uh, the specifically the Swiss space industries do, you don't have... Uh, a lot of detailed information when you follow the NAS, the ESA program. But for instance, Keops, Keops is a is a very uh, <clears throat> very interesting program studying exoplanets uh, using this uh, small spacecraft uh, that was born in Switzerland with the University of Bern and University of Geneva with a lot of a contribution of the 
aerospace industry here in Switzerland. And uh, I go mainly through the NASA and ESA websites. And of course, being at the Swiss Space Center, uh, I get a lot of uh, direct information about the um, activities in Switzerland related to space and the uh, contribution of the Swiss aerospace industry to the space program. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, so it seems like we've uh, exhausted the options. Uh, uh, the, the moderator is thanking you already. Um, it's been a, a very instructive session for all of us. Uh, we really hope uh, people has learned, uh, have learned uh, uh, interesting stories from uh, astronauts and how, how they can use their advice uh, to, to apply it to their day-to-day -day, uh, lockdown life. Um, uh, so usually we have, you know, in, in an usual event, you have questions coming after individually to the panelists, but due to the nature of, of uh, our, our event here, there's not going to be um, anything else to ask uh, for the audience to, to the panelists. So uh, this will wrap it up. Uh, so again, thanks um, for being here. Uh, Claude, we always the best for uh, the following. And you can always please follow Avgustos and um, Avgustos uh, and his social media pages. Please help him for his endeavor. Um, of course, uh, Claude, yes. one last thing we can mention is about this uh, mentorship plan. I don't know if you want to mention something about it. About what? Uh, the, the mentorship plan you had, uh, perhaps? For... Oh, mentorship plan, yes. Well, there, there will be soon a, a new selection of astronauts at ESA. And of course, uh, all the citizens, uh, men and women of all the member states of ESA, we have 22 member states, including uh, Greece and Switzerland for the small countries. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, any citizen of these member states having had the proper level education in the sciences or engineering or me medical and who is in a good physical shape and mental stability can can apply. Uh, I don't have the details about this application, but I would be ready to give some uh, mentoring and give some advice uh, to the ones uh, who would be interested to listen to, to my own story and my own uh, advice. I don't know exactly how we will do this, but uh, again, I'd be, I'd be ready and more than willing to coach anybody who would like to get some advice from me. Again, I don't know exactly how we'll, we'll be doing this, but somehow we need to do this within the next few months. Uh, I think if you enter this selection with already the proper mindset, um, how to maximize the likelihood that you will succeed, that you're already on a, on a good footstep. And uh, I think it would be a pity not to use this opportunity to uh, interact with these potential candidates. Um, I'd be willing to do this in a form that is still to be defined. Okay, so thanks very much for this uh, valuable information. Uh, Augusto, did you have anything to add before? Did I cut you or is it all good now? Mm, yes, uh, I would like to provide to our audience uh, with um, that uh, I was very lucky to be selected uh, by the first uh, private company that recruits and selects career astronaut candidates to participate in suborbital flights uh, and who constitutes the crew members for the first future commercial space flights. The company is called Advancing X and uh, the call for, for 2020 is still open. So everyone uh, can Google the career astronaut competition and uh, can find all the requirements that are needed to, to take uh, a chance to go in space. So uh, try it. You never know what we what will happen in the future. Okay, thanks. So uh, thanks again also to Professor Nicolier who, who's offering to, to help uh, uh, eventual candidates in the, in the future. I think this, this is a fantastic opportunity for anyone who is uh, interested in, in, in taking this uh, most selective, I guess, career path. Um, so just to conclude this talk, I would like to thank uh, again very much the audience, but also the associations and in particular um, the organizing committee uh, in the likes of Roman, uh, Miguel, Rashmi, Eric, Evita, um, um, Argyro also for this nice logo design, um, Anastasia, thank you very much, uh, and all the VSCTH association, Avid, uh, Miwel, uh, thanks Miguel again for the moderation 
And of course, a, a huge thanks to, to uh, Professor Nicolier who took uh, time out of his schedule for this talk and to inspire people uh, of the next generation to, to, to work on themselves and, and uh, provide us advice on, on the current historic, I guess, pandemic that we're living uh, uh, through today. And uh, of course, the same goes for Augustus. Uh, thanks a lot for your, uh, for your involvement here. And uh, we, we sincerely hope uh, um, that uh, you are in the right path for, you, for the achievement of your endeavors and uh, wish you the best of luck in, 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 in doing that. So um, if there are no comments uh, to make anymore, I, I think we can uh, slowly close this panel. Um, uh, so uh, thank you very much for joining us again. I hope the audience also enjoyed it. And uh, we do hope to see you in, in, the, in the future in one of our events. Well, uh, thanks, thanks to you, Soteris, for an excellent moderation of the event. That was very good. And uh, good luck to Augusto to, to make it to space. Thank you very much, Soteris. I think that uh, I learned a lot of things today from you, Professor. And I promise that I will do my best to achieve my endeavors and my final goal. And uh, I hope that we uh, will have a chance to become a, an astronaut in the future. And of course, I will apply for the European Aids Agency uh, call later this year. Good luck. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been a great time to have both of you. Uh, thanks a lot. And I think we can uh, close now. Uh, so the YouTube live stream can go. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Professor. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you.